In our previous video, we had discussed the development of Hong Kong in the context of the history of southern China. We had ended with the last imperial dynasty of the Qings, ceding control of the region to the British through a series of treaties resulting from the Opium Wars. These will be important to recap once more as the terms will dictate much of Hong Kong's future history. But first, a big thanks to ExpressVPN for making this video possible. The first treaty in 1842 gave the British control of Hong Kong Island, while the second treaty of 1860 extended this boundary up to the Kowloon Peninsula and Stonecutters Island. The terms of the deal listed the land grants as a perpetual lease. This is to be contrasted with the Treaty of 1898 when the new territories and the surrounding islands were ceded to the British as a 99-year lease. This meant that if nothing changed, the territory of Hong Kong was scheduled to be split up in the year 1997. For the time being, however, the British Empire was at its peak and would have had little concern about dealing with such an issue in the future. Their more immediate concern would be with managing yet another one of their colonial acquisitions. The Crown Colony of Hong Kong would be organized according to a series of imperial decrees. The letters patent formed the constitutional basis, while the royal instructions dealt with governance. The result was as follows. The head of government was the governor. They were appointed by the British monarch and served as the crown's chief representative. The governor held much power and had authority over British military forces stationed in the area. In addition, they appointed most members of both the legislative and executive councils. These two bodies advised the governor, passed laws, and appropriated public funds. Beyond this, Hong Kong was administered on the local level by the Chinese bureaucracy that had previously existed. This group might be able to offer some advice to their new overlords, but had effectively no official checks and balances on their power. The judicial system was based on English law, with the Supreme Court functioning as the highest court. However, at first, this only applied to foreigners, while the locals would be subject to Chinese customary law administered by their own magistrates. This colonial administration ruled over a population of 125,000 people according to the census of 1865. The locals greatly outnumbered the foreigners, who only numbered around 2,000 and were concentrated around Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon Peninsula. As would happen in many other colonial domains, the small ruling class would extend its rule over the population by recruiting the help of native elites. This upper class group served as the principal communicators and mediators between the imperial government and the general population. Some of the prominent figures who found roles within the emerging Hong Kong hierarchy were Sir Kai Ho and Robert Ho Tung. While the upper classes may have been relatively easy enough to co-opt and control, the common Chinese subjects would prove more difficult to tame. During the early colonial period, crime rates were on the rise as a result of the instability caused by the Opium Wars and the recent change in government, as well as the region's long history of piracy. Outright rebellion even began to break out. In 1899, for instance, residents of Kam Tin took up armed resistance within their walled city. Several British assaults were repelled before the main iron gates were blown off with dynamite and the rebels subdued. To prevent the situation from spiraling out of control, something had to be done. The British knew that they could not simply rely on military might to do so. Instead, they would begin to take other measures to maintain control of Hong Kong over the generations. One of the main ways to control Hong Kong would be to win the support of the population through assimilation. This was primarily achieved through education, which introduced Western-style philosophy, history, science, technology, and finance into the culture. Christian missionaries were already active in the area and had laid much of the groundwork through the establishment of numerous village schools, 20 of which were established in Hong Kong by 1860. Yet at this time, the upper classes still continued to send their children to major cities on the mainland for traditional Chinese education. This would slowly begin to change with the introduction of institutions of higher learning in the early 20th century. Founded in 1911, the University of Hong Kong would prove to be one such school that shifted the balance in favor of a Western-style education. Over the years, subsidized and eventually free schooling would ensure that generations of Hong Kongers would pass through the mold of the English educational system. But it wasn't just the people who were now adopting the English tongue, the landscape was as well. 
bays, hills, rivers, streets, and all manner of local areas took on western names. Visiting Hong Kong today, you can easily find yourself in Victoria Harbour, Aberdeen Park, Oxford Road, or Baker Street. This is all evidence of a region that was transformed through the colonial period. The nexus of this change would be around the areas of commercial activity along Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon Peninsula. It was here that the foreigners had first set up shop and were now operating their numerous shipping, merchant, and financial companies. The first large-scale modern bank opened its doors in 1865, and the first electric company lit up the streets in 1890. Soon, even early automobiles would be seen mixing with the pedestrians, rickshaws, and litters traveling the bustling streets. All of this business required local labor and expertise, which in turn attracted even more services to support these people. Thus, an economic system arose that managed to harness the profits of global trade and funnel them down into a concentrated area. This led not only to rapid development, but also a huge population increase. In fact, by 1916, the population of Hong Kong had exploded to 530,000. That's a five-fold increase in just 50 years. However, growth did not come without strain. The wealth pouring into the city was not shared equally, and wealth inequality skyrocketed. Poorer immigrants flooding into Hong Kong found themselves in cramped, squalid conditions whose danger began to manifest almost immediately. Sanitation became a real issue, as the late 1890s saw outbreaks of dengue fever and even the plague claim hundreds a day at their peaks. Fires also proved deadly, and powerful storms such as typhoons of the 1870s killed thousands. Yet despite these setbacks, Hong Kong continued its charge into the 20th century. However, stronger headwinds would soon buffet Hong Kong in the form of various global shakeups. One of the main contributors in the East would be a widespread movement to resist foreign influence. In China, this frustration was largely directed at the Qing government, which proved disastrously incompetent at modernizing the country and confronting Western aggression. In 1911, a great revolution broke out, which precipitated the collapse of the last imperial dynasty. In its place would rise the Republic of China. One of the leading figures of the revolt was Sun Yat-sen, a graduate from the British schools in Hong Kong who espoused a more liberalized government. However, the transition would be far from smooth, and for over a decade the country was embroiled in conflict between various coalitions. This turbulence was amplified by the outbreak of World War I in 1914. Together, both of these weakened the trade networks which had brought Hong Kong such success so far. In addition, many began to worry about the risk of invasion. This fear prompted a widespread exodus from the colony of 60,000 residents. As the war progressed, however, Hong Kong managed to maintain relative stability and regained a degree of confidence. The colony forged new powerful trade networks and attracted a fresh wave of immigrants fleeing the chaos elsewhere. This would not last long. The 1930s brought about the Great Depression, which dropped worldwide GDP by an estimated 15% and saw international trade greatly decrease. This was bad news for the trading hub of Hong Kong. Even worse news came with the outbreak of World War II and the advance of Japanese forces across Southeast Asia. The war came to Hong Kong in December of 1941, on the same morning as the attack on Pearl Harbor. The battle lasted 18 days and saw the invading Japanese pitted against a garrison of British, Indian, and Canadian troops fighting alongside Chinese soldiers and conscripts. The exposed new territories were overrun rather quickly as the defenders fell back to man gin drinkers line along the Kowloon Peninsula. However, sneak attacks by the Japanese penetrated the defenses, cutting short what was expected to be a lengthy siege and paving the way for an assault on Hong Kong Island. Soon, the defense proved untenable, and the British colony raised the white flag of surrender. Japanese occupation would last almost four years. During the period, Hong Kong was subjected to martial law, with the military taking control of the entire government and many economic centers. Strict measures were put in place to control the population. These included the imposition of trade regulations, the mandating of a new currency, and broad efforts to push Japanese culture. As was seen elsewhere, the occupiers also inflicted a great deal of suffering on the people. Hyperinflation and supply shortages wrecked the economy, throwing thousands into poverty, 
while strictly enforced rationing led to malnutrition and starvation. In addition, an estimated 10,000 civilians were executed, and yet many others were tortured, mutilated, or raped. Resistance groups fought back as best they could, but were met with swift punishment. The brutal conditions and resulting emigration cut the population of Hong Kong by more than half of its pre-war peak of 1.6 million. Finally, Japanese rule would end in 1945 with their surrender to the Allied powers. The territory was officially returned to the British on August 30th, and Japanese war criminals were convicted and executed the following year. The situation at the end of the war was a complicated one in China. Basically what happened was that the country was still very much fractured following the collapse of the Qing dynasty. Major groups still feuded amongst each other during the Japanese occupation and now had even more incentive to do so upon the withdrawal of the occupying forces. The major contenders were the Kuomintang-led government of the Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party that had emerged to the north from Russian influence over the last few decades. Japan's unconditional surrender technically ordered their troops to surrender to KMT government forces, but this did not prevent a widespread power grab by the communists, especially in the countryside and in Manchuria, where Russian troops had been positioned. What resulted was a massive civil war, which saw millions of troops mobilized. The Cold War powers paid close attention, with Russia backing the communists of Mao Zedong and the United States and its allies backing the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. The bloody conflict that claimed millions of lives resulted in the communists gaining control of the mainland while the nationalists retreated to Taiwan for a standoff, with both sides claiming to be the legitimate representative of China. No peace treaty was signed, and to this day, the island's political status is still a contentious issue. Watching all this unfold, the tiny British colony of Hong Kong was quaking in its boots. However, the communist takeover would stop at its borders. One of the primary reasons was that advancing further would be viewed as a declaration of war on an ally of the US. The mess of Korea would lie heavily on everyone's mind, and the route of more peaceful coexistence was chosen instead. After all, why risk human, material, and reputational costs when 90% of Hong Kong was already set to be returned with the expiration of its lease in just a few decades. Better to wait patiently for now. Hong Kong in the 1950s would quickly rebound from its depressed state during the war years. The disruptions in mainland China drove many refugees with skills and capital to the British haven while many firms from rich places like Shanghai relocated to avoid communist intervention. All of this meant that vast pools of cheap labor and investment poured into the territory. What had previously been an economy centered around trade now began to diversify. This was accelerated by Cold War era embargoes that greatly restricted the activity of merchants in the region. In response, industry and manufacturing exploded, starting with textiles and expanding to clothing, electronics, plastics, and other labor-intensive exports, the colony became one of the pioneers of Eastern industrialization. Hong Kong's economic miracle had begun. As the economy of Hong Kong transformed, so too did the people and the environment. By the mid-1950s, the population reached 2.2 million and within a decade exceeded 3 million, with even more immigrants pouring in every day. The area was quickly becoming one of the most densely populated in the world. The government attempted to deal with the overcrowding by launching ambitious land reclamation and public housing projects. New industrial towns were built to house immigrants, provide employment, and aid industry. With little room to expand out, Hong Kong began its ascent upwards. The skyline soon became filled with high-rises and skyscrapers. Some of these would completely engulf their historical foundations, like the famous walled city in Kowloon. Elsewhere, you'd see parks, cinemas, malls, and all kinds of hallmarks of a modern metropolis spring up. Schools were another major feature of the changing landscape, as new programs ensured that thousands were built throughout the 50s and 60s, which helped ensure that Hong Kong's children continued to get a proper education in the British fashion. Once again, we'll have to note that this growth came with strain. Levels of income inequality continued to rise, with issues of sanitation, crime, and natural disasters rearing their heads again. As examples, the deadly Hong Kong flu infected half a million residents. Gangs like the Triads infested the cities, 
and typhoons and fires left tens of thousands homeless. But perhaps the most dangerous threat of all, at least to the British, would be the rise of communism. This was of greatest concern in the 60s with the launching of Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution. The socio-political movement's stated goal was to preserve Chinese communism by purging the remnants of capitalist and traditional elements from Chinese society. Across the country, millions were persecuted and hundreds of thousands were killed as clashes took place between factions of all walks of life. The student-led paramilitary group known as the Red Guards proved quite infectious in their ability to spread across the network of schools in China. The Cultural Revolution inevitably seeped into the Western colonies. In 1966, Portuguese Macau was brought to its knees by revolutionaries. Meanwhile, Hong Kong was also dealing with growing tensions. These boiled over in 1967 with large-scale riots between pro-communist and government forces. At the height of the violence, assassinations and waves of bombings spread across the city, with over 8,000 devices diffused by British forces. Eventually though, the riots drew to a close as the violent protesters lost the sympathy of the people, and the government finally announced it would reform. The unrest of the 60s, coupled with the looming expiration of the territorial lease, served as a catalyst for Hong Kong's transformation in the last days of British rule. The Crown realized that a battle was underway for the heart and soul of the people. If it were to maintain any influence in the region, steps had to be taken to ensure that a wedge was driven between the territory and the mainland such that Hong Kongers found themselves aligned more with the Western ideology. This would involve fostering Hong Kong's self-identity and actually practicing what the supposedly democratic overlords preached. Major initiatives took the form of massive social welfare programs. These included the announcement of Governor Murray's 10-year housing plan in 1973 whose objective was to provide accommodations for 1.8 million people. Many new public housing projects would be launched in the years to follow. Legislation was also passed to require equal pay for equal work, and injustice was further combated with reforms to the police and government, which opened the doors to more local representation. A sense of regional community was further fostered by government-hosted events like the Clean Up Hong Kong campaign and the Hong Kong Festival. In addition, bureaucratic crime was tackled in 1974 with the founding of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. It would prove so successful that Hong Kong would eventually become one of the least corrupt societies in the world. As a result of these measures, standards of living rose across the board. Adding to this upswing, Hong Kong's economy boomed under the non-interference policy introduced by the colonial government. The region's economic worth peaked at 27% that of the entire People's Republic of China. All this success certainly set Hong Kong apart as a jewel of the East and made people proud to call themselves Hong Kongers. Thus, the British had achieved their aims as they headed into the negotiations with China. In the mid-1980s, British and Chinese delegations began to open serious discussions about the future of Hong Kong. The Chinese strongly held that all of Hong Kong be returned to them, but recognized that much of the region's value was owed to its current status quo. The British also realized that compromise was necessary, as their permanently leased territories were inextricably linked to the rest of the region, and that they could not realistically hope to hold on to them. By 1984, both sides came to an agreement that the whole of Hong Kong would pass into Chinese control, but that it would retain a high degree of autonomy and a preservation of its lifestyle. This Sino-British joint declaration, signed between Premier Zhao Ziyang and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, declared that upon the expiration of the Hong Kong lease on July 1st, 1997, the region would become a special administrative region for a period of 50 years until 2047. The joint declaration also outlined China's policies towards Hong Kong. These policies were listed in the agreement with a final condition that they serve as a basis for the constitutional document known as the Basic Law that would govern the special administrative region. Shortly thereafter, the National People's Congress of China issued a draft which would pass through a committee with representatives from Hong Kong's government, business, and industrial sectors before being finalized in 1990. Thus, the mechanisms were set for the handover of 1997. In the intervening years, there would be quite a bit of maneuvering amongst the government and business entities to best secure their position in a post-transfer world. In 1994, for instance, 
the British government pushed through electoral reforms to quicken the pace of democratization in the face of China's efforts to stamp them out in the mainland, as was evidenced by the Tiananmen Square Massacre. These constitutional changes, aimed at broadening Hong Kong's democratic base, were taken by China as a violation of the previous joint declaration. Tensions would continue to rise until the deadline of June 1, 1997. The fateful day would be marked by handover ceremonies broadcast around the world. Events included marches, speeches, fireworks, and a switching of the flags at midnight. Thereafter, British forces left Hong Kong and were replaced by their Chinese counterparts. Since then, Hong Kong has continued to evolve. With the relative continuity of its transition, the special administrative region maintained its rocketing population and economic growth. As evidence, a brand new international airport was created, and even Disneyland moved in. Yet as we have seen many times in the past, this growth would produce strain and one of the highest wealth gaps in the region's history. As time has passed, much of the surrounding region has caught up to Hong Kong's economic lead. China as a whole has seen massive industrialization and a shift towards a more open economy with greater receptivity to foreign investment. This is especially true along the Pearl River Delta, where megacities have intertwined into an enormous metropolis whose economic output now rivals its neighbor. To illustrate this point, Hong Kong now accounts for close to just 2% of China's GDP as compared to its high of 27% in 1993. As a result, manufacturing has increasingly moved to the mainland and Hong Kong has turned more heavily to financial services, tourism, and retail trade. While this has kept its economy afloat, trends do indicate that it is no longer the exclusive powerhouse it once was. Looking forward, this fact will take away one of Hong Kong's primary forms of leverage when it comes to negotiating its future with China in 2047 when the special administrative region will end and it becomes officially incorporated into Chinese territory. Reliance on foreign help might also be questioned when one compares the highly involved Western powers of the Cold War to their modern counterparts which have experienced a rise in nativism and isolationism. Therefore, much attention has been turned towards politics where the people of Hong Kong have had to stand up for themselves. Over the last few years, popular demonstrations like the Umbrella Movement and the more recent anti-extradition protests have fought back against increasing intervention from China. I hope my videos have helped provide sufficient context for the deep-rooted background of these events. I've truly loved learning more about the fantastic history and people of Hong Kong, and will be watching attentively as they fight for their future. Thank you all for watching. As we've seen, the world is a rapidly evolving place. The internet is at the forefront of this action, and now, more than ever, demands you take steps to ensure your privacy and security. Through our sponsor, ExpressVPN, you can be sure to have the latest in modern online protection by having your web traffic encrypted and your IP address masked. With over 2,000 servers across 94 countries, they offer uncensored access to sites and services from across the globe at lightning fast speeds. As an example, I've used their service while hooked up to public Wi-Fi at hotels, airports, and cafes to safeguard my personal information, like financial details and account logins, and to prevent anyone from sniffing around my laptop. ExpressVPN offers internet without restrictions, and with 24-7 customer support to help you when you need it. Get three months free with a one-year package today by going to expressvpn.com slash Invicta to learn more. The deal amounts to just seven bucks a month, and they've got a 30-day money-back guarantee, so give it a shot if you're interested. A huge thanks is owed to our supporters on Patreon, and the many talented researchers, writers, and artists who made this video possible. Please consider contributing to fund future content. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.